subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's IA Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the daily edition of Hindu newspaper and are equally relevant for your UPSC preparation. Articles dated 22nd of December 2021 are listed on your screen and the time stamping for these articles is already given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article was published on page 12 of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper which is the business page. The article says that India's crude oil output extend slides and declined by 2% in November. Well, from the perspective of this examination, it is important for the student to understand the current status of crude oil and natural gas in the country. And that is the reason why we have taken this article to be in the extended form and to be the major article for today. The context of the article says that India's output of crude oil continued to decline even in November, with lower output from the state-owned firms leading to a more than 2% drop. Well, this 2% seems to be very small, but the kind of India's dependence on foreign fuel and foreign sources are concerned, this drop is not a good sign. Because as of now, India is importing more than 90% of its demand from outside. And such a drop in its domestic production will lead to further deterioration in its aspiration towards making India more self-reliance as far as external imports of fuels are concerned. The relevance of this article from the fact of prelim examination. Well, UPSC can ask on the trends of crude oil data. Well, here data is not required per se, but basic trends that is whether it is increasing, whether it is decreasing, what is the ratio of imports, what is the basic ratio of oil to natural gas in others could be asked. As far as means examination is concerned, well, this is a very important topic for your general studies paper one under distribution of key natural resources across the world. And in general studies paper three, it is important under the category of infrastructure because oil refineries and gas pipelines are part of infrastructure. And it is also important from the perspective of mobilization of resources in the country and fuel resources are one of the most important factors for developing an economy. The content for this article would include the discussion on the current status of oil and gas industry, challenges in oil and gas industry and what government measures have been taken in order to promote and revive this industry. Before anything else, let us analyze the data as of now. As you can see, we will discuss about the key trends of this sector. Well, from the export perspective of petroleum products from India, you can see that there is a fluctuation in the last four years and in 2021, there was a sharp decline also. And even this year, there is one of the sharper decline that India has seen as far as export of petroleum product is concerned. When we go towards the product wise exports of the petroleum products, you can see the highest exports comes from pet coke. On the other hand, India's exports for LPG and other lubricants is very, very low. Government has already started the 100% FDI in exploration as well as production of these products. India has already launched national exploration and licensing policy along with the exploration of cold bed methane. India is also one of the nation which is providing freight subsidy in order to transport the fuel from one place to another. As far as imports are concerned, well, as you can see, the imports and the domestic oil production are as follows. Between 2016 to 2021, there was a considerable rise and a sudden fall as far as imports of oil is concerned. However, on the other hand, India's production in domestic sector has been fluctuating and it is at lowest in the current financial year. As far as gas is concerned, India's production as well as imports are more or less the same. As you can see here, the range of highest and the lowest is very low when compared to oil. In India, the highest oil production comes from the public sector undertakings and 
and private sector contributes the lower ratio. Onshore drilling and others contribute the major portion, however, offshore contribute the lower portion as far as drilling activities is concerned. So all these data will help you to write a balanced introduction as well as arguments in the body part if a question related to the challenges or the current status of oil as a natural resource is asked in the examination. Now let us look towards some of the pointers for your prelims as well as the mains examination. Well, India's refining capacity is 259 million metric tons, but the crude oil production is just 4.9. It simply means that India is importing 98% of its demand from outside and just producing 2% in the domestic market. India's current strategic oil reserves on which we have already conducted a separate video under the DNS so you can find that in the search box of YouTube. So India's current strategic oil reserve is around 5.3 million ton which is almost equivalent to 1 to 3 days of production and government is planning to expand this beyond 90 million metric tons. Currently, India's three states that is Assam, Gujarat and Rajasthan accounts for more than 96% of oil production in the country. Rajasthan is known for Badmir, Gujarat is known for onshore and both offshore and we have the best example of Dig Boy from Assam. According to the International Energy Agency, India's consumption of natural gas, which is less polluting in its nature, is going to grow up to 25 billion cubic meter per year, which is over 50% of the current production of the country. However, at the same time, India is trying to increase and commercialize its strategic petroleum reserve. Now, the point is, why should India commercialize these strategic petroleum reserve? When it comes to strategy, government should have the better hand. But the reason for commercializing this strategy is that this sector is not profitable for the government. And it consists the high risk of storage. So government is thinking why not invite the private sector which can bring managerial efficiency and technological upgradation in order to store India's fuel for the upcoming demands. These strategic petroleum reserves would act as the shock buffer whenever there is a sudden rise in the demand or whenever there is a sudden fall in the supply of fuel from the international market. Recently, that is in July 2021, Indian Oil Corporation, that is one of the largest producer and supplier of oil in the country, has established India's first green hydrogen plant at Mathura refinery. Green hydrogen here simply means that hydrogen will be produced utilizing, that is hydrogen will be produced from the raw material, but the production process will be green and will not include any kind of harmful emission. Now, when we go towards the map of refineries in India, the number of refineries extended across the nation. There are over 15 states in the country which have refineries of different nature and capacity. These refineries are connected through integrated pipeline system and transport both crude oil as well as the natural gas from one place to the other. And these refineries are acting as a lifeline for Indian economy from the perspective of energy security. From the map, you can easily see the largest refinery in India is by the Reliance Industries Limited and it has 35 metric billion tons per NM capacity, which is one of the highest in the world. And this is under the private sector. Now, from this perspective, we can easily identify that the role of private sector is extremely important in order to have energy security in India. Now, let us move towards the challenges of this sector. Well, the first one is shortage of petroleum crude. The petroleum industry in India has been suffering from the problem of shortage of raw material, that is crude petroleum oil. Despite having so high refining capacity, the domestic production remains very low. And this 
and because of this the industry has to depend too much on the imported crude oil that too with the opec nation that are subjected to the cartelization and because of this cartelization these nations are arm twisting the nations like india and deliberately control the supply of their raw material which impacts the india's fuel pricing and the overall economy this has created the increasing volume of demand supply gap and because of this gap the profit made by the indian fuel industry is not too good they cannot reinvest the money in the petroleum refineries and the production capacity has not been achieved fully then comes the lack of market determined pricing system there is a lack of well functioning market determined pricing system because of the lack of vibrant competition among the companies with a diversified ownership and this continues to constrain the performance of petroleum industry as well as the natural gas industry despite the surge in the international prices these companies are not allowed to revise their market prices of petrol because of the government control and popular politics however when the price when the international prices are low they have to reduce their prices keeping a basic margin in their hand then comes the dependence on the foreign countries as we have already discussed india's refinery capacity is 98% against the 2% of domestic production so this 90% per- 98% includes the 2% of crude oil which is being produced in india and the other 96% is coming from outside as a crude oil and is being processed and refined in the country and india has been depending too much on these countries for the supply of crude and the machineries and not only this even the machineries such as drilling machines refinery machineries and basic infrastructures is also imported from outside this is not only against the basic terms of trade of india but also loses out on the precious foreign exchange of the country then comes the price hike since 1973 74 there is a consistent rise in the prices of the crude oil and the natural gas this is because of the cartelization of oil producing and exporting countries and as i said they have arm twisted developing countries like india and china india is also short of oil refining capacity the india's capacity as of now is only 250 to 260 million tons against the demand of over 350 million metric tons and because of this india has to somehow import the refined oil also which is based on the expensive refining process of other countries over the past few years there has been an outcry related to the climate change and because of this government's focus towards oil and natural gas has been on the downward trend government is looking to go for renewable energy and trying to supplement it with the oil and natural gas when government try to do that the private sector is discouraged they are discouraged to explore more oil and find out the competitive routes to keep prices stable and provide the efficient market so here the real issue is what and how to balance between renewable and non renewable energy sources then comes the technical problems the petroleum industry of the country is suffering from numerous technical problems in respect of production of middle distilleries activating its fire fighting system and others and this needs to be corrected and updated as early as possible the research and development facilities in these industry should be expanded with the maximum possible limit to face these technical problems the managerial problems are also part of this macro issue the managerial of the public sector undertakings is controlled by the government policy of the day and lastly there are the issues related to the exploration of new reserves the current production of petroleum crude and natural gas from the existing reserves has been shrinking due to normal and technical reasons 
For instance, the Dig Boy in Assam. Now this place is century old. And this is going through the falling efficiency and capacity to meet the demand of the nation. The proved oil reserves in India constitute only 0.5% of the total world oil production and reserves. So if India does only produce its own domestic oil, then depending on the current status and demand, India will exhaust its own oil in the next 15 to 20 years. And that is the reason why India is thinking to preserve its own oil and consume from the imports. However, this is going as a backfire on India's balance of trade. So meeting all these challenges, India has done the following initiative. India has recently announced that it will release 5 million barrels of crude oil from its strategic petroleum reserve. This will reduce the prices which are impacted from the heavily priced imports. Government has recently set up a committee to work out the measures which are required to make natural gas available to power plants at reasonably stable prices. They have already allowed 100% of foreign direct investment in this sector. They have already called for international collaboration with nations like United States to expand the energy collaboration by focusing on emerging fuels. This include shale oils and shale gas. India has already released the ethanol procurement policy. This will reduce the burden on oil and natural gas. Because once this ethanol is produced domestically, the blending of this ethanol and its procurement by the government will reduce the heavy dependence from outside. Let's take for example, India is importing let's say 95% of its oil from outside and the 5% is produced from domestic market. Now if India increases this procurement for by let's say 5% then on the same ground it will reduce its import by 5% and total import will amount at 90% only. This is the reason why government is focusing towards ethanol blended petrol program. Government has recently launched Kaya Curve Kailasha which is launched by the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas and it has enabled entrepreneurs from scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in providing the bulk LPG transportation to the people across the nation. The recent draft LNG policy that is liquefied natural gas policy also aims to increase India's LNG regasification capacity. Both these points shows that India is focusing more from oil based economy to gas based economy. This is more greener and less polluting. Government schemes such as Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana has already increased the consumption of gas in the country. And lastly, India has also signed numerous international cooperation in order to maintain the competitive pricing and regular supply through gas pipelines. And TAPI is one such example. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 5th of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper and talks about an important species which was recently rediscovered in India and this species is related to the Indian flap shell turtle. Now the article talks about a rarely found species of albino Indian flap shell turtle. This species was recently rediscovered in state of Telangana in Srinampalli forest. The name of this species is given from the presence of femoral flap located on the plastron. Now, for those who do not understand this, let me simplify this for you. There are two sides of a shell which a tortoise have. The upper side is semicircular and the lower side is quite flat. This part or the upper part is very hard. However, in comparison to it, the lower part is softer. The back side or let's say this is the face of a turtle. So the back side of a turtle that is from this area to this area has small flaps and these flaps are of this shape that is irregular shape. So when this turtle is turned upside down, we will find those kind of flaps, those shapes in the bottom part of turtle and that is the basic recognition of this subspecies of turtle.
As per the International Union for Conservation of Nature, it is a vulnerable species and it is found in the red list. And because of this, this species is considered to be under threat and requires special protection. Beyond this, nothing is required for you to study in this article. So let us move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 10 of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper and talks about the regional geographical phenomena known by the name Chillai Kalan. Well, this is a deep freezing situation and lasts for 40 days in the area of Kashmir and its surrounding. It is the harshest spell of winter which is located, which is being observed and the minimum temperature remains sub-zero for the entire valley of Kashmir. So, from the prelims perspective, this article is important because keywords or geographical keywords could be asked in this examination. So, you should be well prepared of these local terms used for geographical phenomena. The Chilai Kalan start in the second half of December, that is after 15 December and last till the end of January, that is around 40 to 45 days. The temperature of this the temperature during this period drops considerably leading to the freezing of water bodies that is for example dull lake there is a persistent and frequent cold wave which comes from the siberia and also from the ladakh region in this area it has three different parts first is chillai kalan that ends on 31st of january it is followed by chillai kurd for 20 more days and in the last of the series, there is Chillai Bacha, that is baby cold, which lasts till the beginning of March. So, from the prelims perspective, try to remember the key words. It could be asked in this examination. So, let us move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 8th of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper and talks about Government of India's reservations and apprehension about World Press Freedom Index. This index was released recently. However, Government of India has identified certain flaws in this index and has criticized this index for being partial towards the developed nations and has also criticized this index for being too opaque in its nature. The context says that center does not agree with the conclusions which were drawn by reporters without borders about their press freedom index and its report on India. This index is published by a foreign non-government organization that is NGO with the name Reporters Without Borders and India has got a rank of 142 out of 180 countries despite being a good source of democracy as well as freedom of speech and expression that is retreated and continuously being protected by the Supreme Court or the judiciary in the country. This index includes six important parameters. That is, whether the press or the media is being judged on pluralism, whether the media personnel are working under independence, what is the current nature of media's environment and whether there is self-censorship or not. It also talks about the legal framework towards the print media and other forms. It talks about the transparency as far as working of media is concerned. And lastly, it also talks about the quality of infrastructure that support production of news and information. On these parameters, where India ranked poor and where India ranked better has not been disclosed. So, why India disagree with this report? The first is that the report is completely opaque. It does not make that in which parameter which country has scored what. It does not provide a credible source and these sources are not even available for quantitative data. It does not define clearly what press freedom is all about because the quality of infrastructure cannot determine the level of freedom enjoyed by press in a particular country. And lastly, the parameters which are taken up for this report or this index is based on one respondent or one evaluator per country that is just one respondent we will evaluate the performance of entire India 
and his perception will determine India's ranking. So this is a very narrow method of evaluating the press freedom in India. And that is the reason why India has criticized this ranking system and position of India being at 142nd place. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article was published on page 6 of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper and talks about the view of the author regarding the code on wages which were passed recently by the Indian parliament. The recent decision of the central government to start implementing four new labor courts from next financial year has some flaws. According to the author, it will end up in promoting the bonded labor in India. Now, what is bonded labor? Bonded labor simply means that a worker or a labor is forced to work on a particular employment against his or her wishes. Because that bonded labor is depending on the certain circumstances, maybe like income or maybe like place of work that he or she cannot leave the job and have to abide by the stiff restrictions of the employer. For instance, let's say a labor has taken a loan of 50,000 from the company in which he or she is working. Now, he cannot leave the job until and unless he or she pays back the loan amount. So this is a short period of bonded labor. Contractual labor is a kind of bonded labor if it goes in the negative format. The relevance of this article is from the means perspective and not the prelims one. Whenever you go through the newspaper, you are less likely to go through a complete answer kind of article. So an article will never talk about the background, solution, challenges, way forward, everything under one heading. These articles will provide you pointers, arguments. Sometimes the entire article will provide you just one argument to write in the mains examination. But that is extremely important. Because normal test books does not provide us the ample arguments and examples and data that we can support in the means and the writing. And these kind of arguments provided in the newspaper help us to frame a new view, a new ideology, a new aspect towards a current challenges and issue faced in the country. So from that perspective, we will discuss this article. The relevance of this article for your general studies paper 1 and 2 lies in the fact that Bonded labor is important for your Indian society related questions and it is also important for the welfare schemes of vulnerable section. Although this is not a scheme, but whenever there are certain schemes, questions may also ask you about the issues and the challenges in which you can easily write these kind of pointers. The article says that the code of wages regulate wages and bonus payments in all employments where there is any industry, trade or business or in fact the manufacturing process is being carried out. However, it does not make or it does not require the government to explicitly bring on a particular employment under the ambit of minimum wages. Earlier. Whenever there was certain businesses, industry or manufacturing or any other related sector was there. So whether one person is working, whether 5000 person are working, all were covered under the minimum wages. But now government is not required to explicitly say or provide that X or Y type of employment will have minimum wages. It simply means that now it is automatically being extended to guarantee the minimum wages to all the workers in the organized and also in the unorganized sector. Now this is the best point of this code because now it says that whoever, wherever and however act as a worker will get the minimum wages of that particular sector. However, there are certain issues which are there with the new code on wages. Let us compare the Minimum Wages Act 1948 with the code on wages which was implemented recently. 
and we will understand this through an example. Example is, let's say there is a person, Mr. A, and this person is earning, let's say, 50,000 rupees every month. Now, based on the previous act, that is Minimum Wages Act, this person can get loan up to two times the monthly wages. So, he can get a loan of 1 lakh rupees from his employer. And the interest rate will be on the discretion of the employer. That is, employer may charge 10%, 20%, 30% or whatever he or she deemed to be fit. The monthly deduction, that is, you can say EMIs, which the employee will pay back to the employer, cannot be more than 25% of the monthly wages. It simply means that if Mr. A has taken a loan of 1 lakh rupees, his monthly EMI will not be more than 12,500 rupees. However, things have changed now. Now there is no restrictions on the loans which can be given to the employer. That means it is a good sign, but it is also be a form of exploitation because previously there was a guarantee that Mr. A can get up to 1 lakh rupees. But now the employer may say that your salary is 50,000, but you will get only 5,000 rupees as loan because it is on the discretion of the employer. So it can lead to the bonded labor system. An employer can give more loan, let's say 5 lakh rupees and can keep the employee working under the certain conditions which may not be suitable for Mr. A. The new code says that it allows the employer to charge interest rate on loans without putting restrictions on interest rate. This provision remains more or same, more or less the same and prone to the exploitation of the worker because charges of the interest rate could go at any level. And lastly, the monthly deduction cannot be more than 50% of the monthly wages. It simply means the new code on wages will increase the EMI which is being paid by Mr. A to his employer. Overall, it says that higher deduction to recover loan may lead to the less take-home salary for the worker. Also, it may discourage the employees to take loans because the interest rate is high, EMIs are high, so it will discourage the labor to take loan from their employer. And if they have taken the loan on very high interest rate, it will lead towards the bonded labor. So you can quote these kind of examples when there are issues related to the labor or the question related to the labor codes or the situation of labor in the country is concerned. Let us now move to the question of the day. 